Boldwood Presents Finding Happiness at Heritage View Written by Helen Rolfe and read by Gloria Sanders The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter One How did I ever let you talk me into this? Hazel was sitting in a church hall with her good friend Lucy, pencils poised, but she was having trouble attempting to sketch the naked man seated before them. It's all right for you, you're arty. I'm hopeless. Lucy didn't laugh, but the corners of her mouth twitched. You need to get out more and this is a start. I'm being a good friend, and besides, I knew it would be better than coming on my own. I needed to fill my creative well, and I appreciate the support. You didn't tell me it involved nudity, Hazel whispered. You had me thinking we'd be drawing a basket of fruit or an old-fashioned teddy bear. Lucy's pencil stopped its action on her paper, and she turned to face Hazel, keeping her voice low so they weren't disturbing anyone else. To be fair, that is what we did three weeks ago. And according to one of the other ladies, last week they drew a crumpled up paper bag. What would you rather? She glanced briefly in the model's direction, eyebrows raised, before turning her attention back to her sketch. Hazel couldn't help but smile. I suppose it is better than drawing a pile of rubbish. Although, she wouldn't feel self-conscious gawping at a paper bag. She supposed she'd better make a start. The tutor was doling out general advice and making her way around the group, and Hazel would look pretty silly if she didn't at least attempt to do this. And, she supposed, it was fun. It wasn't often, or ever, that she got to sit and stare without judgment at a naked man. Perhaps this was the biggest treat she'd get all summer. Your first life model? The tutor behind her asked in a voice Hazel wished didn't carry quite so well. She also wished her easel was a little higher so she could properly hide behind her paper in case the model looked her way. Yes, she muttered, as quiet as she could. I'm here with Lucy, really. I'm not much of an artist at all. She knew the tutor had already complimented Lucy on the start she'd made with her picture. There aren't any wrongs with art, it's your interpretation, she said, as though Hazel's claim not to be an artist was neither here nor there. Try to relax your shoulders a bit. She lowered her voice. And you'll need to spend a lot of time actually looking at the model, otherwise how can you hope to draw him? Not much difference in age to Hazel's 37 years. She didn't seem uncomfortable at all with the nakedness in such close proximity. Not even when she spoke to the model as though he was a man in the street, fully clothed, nothing to see here. The tutor moved on to someone else, and Hazel got back to her drawing, although every time she stared at the model, she only did it for a few seconds before she had to look away. The rest of the group didn't seem to have her issues, although perhaps they, as artists, thought of him differently. More of an exhibit than a good-looking man without any clothes. All Hazel seemed capable of fixating on was that the only thing separating the group of six wannabe artists and his very fine naked form was a mere couple of metres and a semicircle of easels, pieces of paper and fancy pencils. Remember, no straight lines, we need curves, the teacher vocalised at volume as she continued her rounds, observing, advising. As she attempted more of her sketch, Hazel wondered whether it wouldn't be so bad if the life model didn't have such a good body, or if he was a few decades older, or perhaps if he was a she. Lucy leaned over to whisper to her. Is this the first man you've seen naked since James? Hazel appreciated the interruption. Her sketch was going nowhere fast. For your information, yes it is. He seems to think you'll be naked friends again some day. Hazel shrugged. The jury's out. She and James had been serious. They'd been engaged. But a year ago, Hazel had felt almost as though she was suffocating, and she had a hard time separating whether that was because of James and their relationship, or whether it was because she hadn't dealt properly with what had happened three years ago. 
All she knew was that twelve months ago, she'd had to tell James that she needed time. She needed space. He was still around, on and off, still in her life as a friend, but she didn't know whether she wanted to go back to what they once were. Lucy leaned closer to Hazel's drawing and nodded what Hazel thought might be approval. It's not bad, considering you said you were terrible. You're being far too kind. Don't think I'll be contacting a gallery to put this on display any time soon. All she had was the start, the curve of his shoulder and his torso and around at the bottom, which was where she'd stopped. Thinking about his bum was a step too far. Even though she could only really see the rather strong thigh propped up to conceal certain other bits, she was pretty sure the artists around the other side had a great view of. Every now and then I like to do something out of my comfort zone, Lucy explained when she saw Hazel's hesitation to draw any more, the pencil hovering in her hand. Well, this is definitely out of my comfort zone, said Hazel, her pencil scraping the beginnings of the man's thigh finally, and moving down after she glanced at the muscle and tried to replicate it on the paper. You owe me a drink, or two. Lucy, an artisan blacksmith in Heritage Cove, where they both lived, usually made things from iron, copper, or other materials in her workshop, using an old-fashioned forge for some of the beautiful items. But there was no forge inside this church hall, situated a forty-minute drive from the cove. The only thing heating up around here were Hazel's cheeks when she caught the model's eye. For the most part, he made sure he didn't make eye contact with anyone, but he'd adjusted position as he got comfortable again. Do you think the others sat around that side on purpose? Hazel wondered, although when one of the artists on the other side looked her way, she hoped she hadn't spoken too loudly. You mean, so they see everything, Lucy grinned. The model wasn't sitting there when we set up, remember, so it was potluck as to the angle you got. Don't mind this one too much. Go take a peek. Oh my goodness, Lucy! But Hazel was laughing, and this time more than one person in the group looked her way at the disruption, which made her want to laugh all the more. I will do no such thing. And there's no way I could draw that... It was more than a relief when they reached the end of the class. Hazel couldn't wait to get out of there. She joined in with clapping their appreciation for the model along with everyone else and busied herself packing up the pencils she'd used, collecting her bag, rolling her drawing so nobody else could see it, and by the time she looked up, the model had gone, presumably to find his clothes. Ready. She stood beside Lucy, who was still using the side of her pencil to shade an area on her picture. I wanted to ask the tutor a couple of questions. Lucy pulled a face, sensing Hazel's desire to leave. Do you mind? Not at all, but we're in a one-hour spot outside. She shook off Lucy's rush to pack up. It's not a problem. Give me your keys and I'll move the car if anyone comes while I'm waiting. When Hazel took the keys, she looked closer at Lucy's drawing. You're seriously good at this. I loved every minute. It really looks like him, doesn't it? Hazel cleared her throat as she brought her mind to the picture rather than her vision of the man who'd just posed for it. It really does. If Daniel asks, said Lucy, we drew an eighty-year-old man. I don't want to make him jealous. Lucy's boyfriend, Daniel, didn't strike Hazel as the jealous type at all. He ran the little waffle shack in Heritage Cove, and he was all heart, just like his brother Harvey, who was married to another local friend, Melissa. I won't lie to him, but he'll take one look at your drawing and know full well that the man is nowhere near old age. Hazel left Lucy to talk with the tutor, while she headed out of the shadows from the back door to the church hall and into the evening sunshine. Lucy had driven them both over from the cove, and they'd dropped in on her parents first for tea and scones, which was lovely, but made Hazel miss her own parents all the more. Her mum and dad, Thomas and Sally, had retired to the West Country. It had been their dream for many years, despite their lives and their business in the cove. Hazel and her brother Arnold had known the change was coming. They'd both wanted to take over the business since they were younger, but it still took some getting used to. But she was getting there. 
and she loved her home at Heritage View House, which, along with Heritage View Stables, was situated down a lane leading from the village's main street. Hazel inhaled the rich scent of the brightly coloured rhododendrons on the summer evening air as she reached the end of the path and opened the gate. At least the fresh breeze kept the temperature more bearable after the heat wave that had hit the country last week. It was the one time of the year when Hazel welcomed her early starts at the stables. It was an excuse to get up and get on. She followed the pavement along, taking out her sunglasses to put on, ready to intercept any traffic warden about to pounce. At the start of July, the weather was gorgeous, and the birds in the trees twittered above her as she walked, as though they were as much in support of the season as Hazel was. She'd almost reached the car when she heard a commotion coming from the other side of the road. With parking fines on her mind, she expected it to be someone fighting their corner and pleading with a traffic warden to be let off with a warning. But it wasn't. It's him, she said under her breath, because looking across the road, she instantly recognised the man who'd just modelled for them, despite him wearing clothes now, jeans that hugged his buttocks, a T-shirt that clung just enough to be able to see the outline of his torso and strong shoulders. His light brown hair was cut short, but had waves in it she could imagine being sketched out by pencil, obviously by someone with more artistic talent than herself. Hazel had seen the physical details of this man. She couldn't remember his name, even though the tutor had introduced him to the group. But what she hadn't seen inside that church hall was any hint of his personality besides the confidence to sit there in the nude in front of a bunch of strangers. Now she could see his shoulders were tense as he confronted a group of teenagers a fraction of his age. Should she call the police? His anger was evident. Had those teens been hanging around his car, trying to steal it or vandalise it? But if that was the case, surely they would have run off. It turned her stomach when Hazel saw how scared those teenagers were, frozen to the spot. She'd witnessed that kind of stance before, and it had been terrifying. She'd never forget it. The man before her now had a tightness in his expression that she zoned in on. His clenched jaw, the jerky head movements as he said his piece. He got right up in the face of one of the boys to make whatever point he was trying to get across, and Hazel knew that if that were her standing before him, she'd be petrified. Hazel had her hand on her phone, about to call the police, when the boys ran off, and the man didn't give chase. She reached Lucy's car, the next one up, unlocked it, and climbed in, sinking down in the seat, praying that the man hadn't spotted her. She didn't look up until Lucy got back into the car. You okay there? Lucy, in the driver's seat, wound the window down for air. Hazel sat up straighter, cautiously looking in the wing mirror to check the man had gone. When she saw that he had, she opened her own window. You owe me a drink. I haven't forgotten. The copper plough? Lucy looked at her after mentioning their local pub. What's wrong? Nothing. Just still in shock at what you made me do. <laughs> That's all. She laughed, although the laughter was forced. She didn't want to admit that what she'd just seen was a stark reminder of something she'd been trying to forget for a long time. Her way of coping was to stop her thoughts from ever travelling in that direction again, and it worked, kind of. Parking police, Lucy announced, and wasted no time pulling out of the space. Hazel was more than happy to get well away from here in case she saw that man again. Good-looking, he might be. Particularly naked. But behind that exterior was a whole lot of anger, and she never wanted to be on the receiving end of that kind of fury again. Tell Barney why you owe me, Hazel laughed as they stood at the bar in the copper plough some thirty minutes later, Lucy paying for the round of drinks with her card. Tell him what you had me do. Barney, in his seventies, and a man who had the community's interests at heart, loved nothing more than a good story. I'm all ears. You're making out I tortured you, Lucy tutted. She enjoyed it. She winked at Barney before filling him in on exactly where they'd been. Barney, pint in hand, chuckled away. 
<laughs> I'll bet you didn't expect that, Hazel. It wouldn't be so bad if I could draw, but I couldn't even stare as I was too embarrassed every time the guy looked up. At least it made for a fun time. You young girls need to get out and about a bit. It can't all be business. Lois, love of Barney's life, came over and hooked her arm into his. Did I hear something about a naked man? Look what you started, he grinned to Hazel and Lucy, and off they went to find a table. He's right, you know. Lucy slipped her credit card into her purse. It can't all be work. Don't get me wrong, work is a great distraction. I know that as well as anyone. But it's not everything. With an eye roll, Hazel followed Lucy outside and into the beer garden. It was way too nice to sit inside, and right at the back they found a spare table. Some of the oldies probably didn't want it because local teacher Link was playing his guitar and they might not be able to hear one another. But for the girls, the music simply added to the atmosphere. Talking of work, how's business? Hazel inquired of Lucy. You always seem to have people popping in and out of the workshop. I get lots of commissions, which I love, because with those I can start from scratch, sketch out what they want. I'm still in love with my wine rack, by the way. Hazel sipped her beer as the sun sank a little lower in the sky. Glad to hear it's being used. Good choice by your brother. The Christmas before last, Arnold had commissioned Lucy to design and make a gorgeous wine rack, which was made by joining horseshoes together, and held a couple of wine glasses upright, as well as a couple of bottles. Unbeknownst to Arnold, that same Christmas, Hazel had already asked Lucy to make a boot scraper for her brother, and the ornate piece that sat at the door of the office worked perfectly to rid boots of dirt and mud. He'd loved it, although she was sure she used it more than him because she was the one who handled most of the paperwork in the office while he did the majority of the teaching at the riding school. It had always been the intention that brother and sister would both teach and know their way around the office, just as their parents had done. But Hazel had backed away from the former in a big way. The Heritage View stables were renowned for teaching beginners, and though it was key to their business, it was something Hazel just couldn't manage these days. They talked about Arnold for a while, but Hazel didn't let on that her brother was growing increasingly frustrated at her refusal to teach more classes. It didn't exactly make for a harmonious or tenable family business. He's still single, Hazel smiled at her friend. I always thought he'd settle down first out of the two of us and I'd end up being the spinster living in the big old house with her brother and his wife. What happened to the girl he hung around with last summer? Lucy asked. She was nice, clever too, Hazel replied. So clever, she decided on a career change and took herself off to university in Edinburgh. She wants to be a vet. Talking of vets, did you hear about the new village vet practice opening up on the same road up past the florist any day now? Hazel made a face. I hadn't heard, or I had, but I've forgotten. This was why Lucy, amongst others in the village, was trying to get her out and about more. She spent too much time in her own head with her own problems, and because it was easy to cite the business as a reason to do little other than spend time in the office or busy at the stables, she was missing out on village life. You spend a lot of time thinking about work, too much time, Lucy said. Hazel didn't deny it, but she also didn't add that it wasn't only thinking about work all the time. It was worrying that she was stuck in a rut. Is the new practice opening in the old key-cutting place? Lucy shook her head. Way too small for a vet's, and I think Valerie from the florist has her eye on that place to expand her shop. There has been some talk amongst the younger girls around the cove that they might like a nail salon in the village. I'll bet Barney would have something to say about that. Hazel laughed as the music filled the night air and Link began to take requests. Not much gets past him, and I'm pretty sure a nail salon wouldn't. Tilly tried to wind him up, said there were some real plans being drawn up. Trust Tilly to tease him. Although, given how close they are since Tilly took over her grand's shop and turned it into Tilly's bits and pieces, I suppose she's allowed to and I'll bet he didn't believe her. 
Exactly. He's far too switched on to have been fooled. Don't you worry. So where's the new veterinary practice going to be, then, if not in the old key-cutting place? Lucy explained that it would be in the run-down, bay-windowed old bungalow that had sold a while back. Harvey and Melissa said that if they didn't live in Tumbleweed House, they would have bought the place as a business interest to do up and sell on. They would have done a good job, too, Hazel approved. But a new vet locally is convenient and far less of a pain than travelling out of the cove. A new vet in the village would be good for both of them. Lucy had a slate grey cat called Shadow, who was often seen lying in the sunshine outside her workshop or up towards the waffle shack. Hazel and Arnold had a tabby cat who had wandered into the paddock almost a decade ago. Hazel had scooped the cat up in her arms before she got trodden on by one of the horses. When the cat didn't seem to be in any hurry to leave, Hazel's parents had put up posters around the village to say she'd been found, but nobody ever came forward, and so, with her one eye and unknown age, the vet had estimated around five years old, and under the new name of Tabitha, the cat had made her forever home at the Heritage View stables. Lucy finished her beer. Another round? Come on, I owe you after the art class. Please, don't remind me. She'd tried to put that man out of her mind. His amazing body, the curves and muscles she'd been given permission to look at. And she'd definitely tried to block out his temper. Next time, please let me draw horses. I'm way more comfortable around those. I could make a very inappropriate joke about body parts right now, Lucy laughed. Did you sneak a peek? Couldn't see from where we were sitting, she grinned before heading off to get the drinks. Next time, perhaps. And by the time they'd had a few rounds and Hazel headed home to Heritage View House, she was glad Lucy had dragged her along to something that put her way out of her comfort zone. Because deep down, Hazel knew she needed it. Chapter Two the morning after the art class, Hazel ventured downstairs shortly after six, happy it was summer and the sun came up nice and early. It helped her to get out of bed when the rest of the village was likely sleeping, with the exception of Jade and Celeste, who ran the Twist and Turn Bakery and kept baker's hours. She picked up the post from the mat, a single brown envelope that was most likely something financial. She found Arnold in the kitchen, sitting at the farmhouse table as usual, browsing news on the iPad the way he always did, a mug of coffee in front of him, an empty bowl left behind from his cereal. Hazel set down the envelope and grabbed the sliced bread from the bread bin before locating the butter dish, a knife and a plate. You all right to take the lesson at eleven o'clock? Arnold finished his last mouthful of coffee. I told you I would. The lesson was more of a supervision session for an adult who had been riding here for many years, a friend of their parents. Hazel would merely give tips and guidance for a series of low jumps in a small circuit that she would set up, while the rider and the horse warmed up in the school. Don't take your hangover out on me. At least her snappish tone seemed to amuse her brother. Sometimes he could be too serious, and it detracted from the dark-haired good looks passed down from their dad. Hazel and her brother were complete opposites in looks. She had blonde hair, highlighted all the more from the sun, while he had a few greys now he'd reached forty. She had none to speak of, as she liked to remind him. Hazel had blue eyes, Arnold had brown. Her skin turned a golden brown without much effort at all, while he had to be more careful being slightly fairer. In temperament, however, she liked to think they were pretty similar. They both worked hard, they were both thorough and patient. But while Arnold's way was to meet challenges head-on, Hazel tended to hold back when she feared something. I'm not hungover, Hazel told her brother as she dropped two slices of bread into the toaster before pouring herself a mug of coffee. But taking in the amused expression on her brother's face, she admitted, All right, a couple of beers turned into a fair few, but we had a nice time. He seemed to mellow as he put his bowl and mug in the sink and at the back door pulled on his boots. I'm glad you went out, socialised a bit. You make it sound as though I'm a recluse. She wasn't that bad. 
It was more a case of being busy, focused. She noticed Arnold hovering at the back door. What's wrong? She'd always be able to read him, and he knew it. I had to turn down another booking late last night for three siblings who want riding lessons. We can't fit them in? He raised his eyebrows. Wasn't it obvious? Not with only one of us teaching. I teach, she defended, although she wasn't teaching nearly enough, and her brother was picking up the slack. Their clientele was heavily weighted to the young, inexperienced side, and those were the riders she had a problem with. I'll get back to it properly, I will. We're doing well financially, but you know I hate turning down business, Hazel. This is our livelihood. I said I'd get back to it, she repeated. She hated tension with Arnold. They'd never had much growing up, apart from the usual sibling irritations and bickering. Whose turn it was to dry up the dishes, who hogged the remote control, which one of them got to sit in the front seat if only one parent was in the car on an outing. With a sigh that told of his frustration, he headed outside to open up the gates for the hay delivery, which was due any minute now. I'll be out soon, she called after him, a gentleness to her tone. Heritage View was home, the only home Hazel had ever known or wanted to know. And no matter what happened or the problems she still had, the walls of this house felt safe. Hazel pushed the back door open fully to allow the breeze to bring inside the freshness of the summer season. The back entrance to Heritage View House led out and around the rear of the property. On past the tack room and to the stable block, which was accessible from two sides and the office, as well as an indoor riding school. From the front of the house, with its grand door surrounded by ivy and climbing roses, they could see paddocks directly opposite, and beside those, the outdoor riding school, with further paddocks beyond. All of this land was nestled in Heritage Cove, with the main street of the village a short distance away, walkable or rideable, if that was what you chose. The toast popping up made her jump, and from the larder she found the elderflower jam she'd bought locally to spread on her toast after the butter. As she ate her breakfast, Hazel picked up the brown envelope she'd retrieved from the mat earlier. She realised it was way too soon for the postman, and that actually there was no postmark. With a piece of toast between her teeth, she ripped open the envelope and pulled out the piece of paper inside. A post-it was stuck to the front, which said, in curly writing, Especially for you. Enjoy it whenever you need to. Love Lucy. Kiss. She almost choked on her toast. In her hand was Lucy's picture of the nude model from yesterday, and the way she'd captured him on paper was as though he was sitting here at her kitchen table with her. If Lucy ever decided artisan blacksmithing was no longer for her, she could make a fortune drawing portraits, although Hazel wasn't sure what market there was for nudes. Hazel had only just got up to take her plate and mug over to the sink, and there was a knock at the front door, most likely the actual postman, not Lucy, who must have come by at the crack of dawn to make the delivery. But it wasn't the postman. It was James. He leaned in and kissed her on the cheek, the way he'd become accustomed to doing since they split up. She looked at her watch and then back at him. His cheeks were rosy from the fresh start at this early hour. It's crazy early. She spotted his Audi parked behind him, as though it might be too much effort to walk over from the designated parking area outside the main gates to the house and the riding school. Everyone else seemed to manage to park appropriately, and it was only deliveries that came up this close even when the gates were open. He'd spotted her, eyeing the car. You're going to ask me to move it, aren't you? You'd better. We're expecting a hay delivery. He pointed to the remote and the bleep sounded before he climbed in. One sure way to make him move the car was any threat of it being scratched or covered in debris, and a hay delivery satisfied both of those categories. Hazel hovered at the front door until he jogged back over. I've got to go into the office in London, he explained, as he followed her along the hallway and into the kitchen where she offered him a cup of coffee. 
Then I have a couple of on-site meetings with clients, so it was an early start this morning. I was passing through. Thought I'd stop and check in. He was dressed smarter than usual. Not that he varied much in what he wore. Today he had on charcoal grey trousers and a light blue shirt that complemented eyes of almost the same colour and his blonde wavy hair that was always slightly too long. James had been a consultant solicitor specialising in employment law for well over a decade and had the same passion for his job that Hazel had had for hers until something unexpected had knocked her sideways. It's kind of you to check in. Hazel quickly picked up Lucy's sketch and put it beneath the brown envelope on the side as James sat at the table. She didn't really want to answer questions about why she had a hand-drawn picture of a naked man and why she had obviously been looking at it over her breakfast. What time is your train? Trying to get rid of me already? You know what mornings are like around here. She was glad he'd come now and not once she'd got going with the morning routine as if on cue the rumble of a truck announced the hay delivery. When she put a mug of coffee in front of him, he thanked her, blew across the liquid, and braved a sip. You seem stressed. No more than usual, she said, her standard response. I'm fine. You always say that. I worry about you. I know you do. I appreciate the concern, but I'm still standing. James didn't look too sure. I don't want to see you stressed or running yourself into the ground with too much work. If Arnold heard you say that, he'd flip. He's still doing more than his fair share. I'm sure he's coping. Don't let him give you a hard time. She resisted the urge to leap to Arnold's defence. She shouldn't have bothered mentioning Arnold's workload, as all James saw was the problems she was having. She supposed that was his caring side, the supportive partner role. But it also showed that despite his job and all his worldly experience, when it came to her and her family business, James rarely understood the bigger picture. Running your own business is never easy, he added with another slurp of his coffee. I knew that going into it. All true. But what she hadn't realised was that one event could turn everything upside down when you least expected. She and James had been dating for less than a year when an accident happened at the riding school and well and truly left its mark. James had been there for Hazel through the terrible times and every day since. They'd been engaged when getting married felt like the appropriate next step. Or at least it had until Hazel, confused and all over the place, began to wonder whether she'd clung on to something solid and reliable because everything else was falling apart. She began to be critical of her relationship with James, not about him specifically, but more about what they each wanted in life. And try as she might, she couldn't make their goals align. He wasn't a horse person, not that that mattered. It was good to have different interests, but horses were a major part of her life. And when she and Arnold took on the business from their parents, it became even more so. James had never really seemed on board, even though he insisted he was. You did know it wouldn't be easy, but did you ever predict it would be this hard? He asked her now. And she honestly couldn't answer with anything other than no. So she moved the conversation on to talk about her parents and how they'd settled well into life in the West Country, before asking how his parents were and whether they'd given any more thought to retiring from the law practice. I can't see them ever giving it up, James told her as he finished his coffee. Funny how careers run in the family, isn't it? It doesn't have to be that way. Not if you need a change. He put a hand over hers, and she knew she'd walked right into that one. You have options. Sell your share. Get outside helping. But when she simply smiled before looking at her watch again... He picked up on the hint, taking his cup to the sink and rinsing out the dregs. I'll get going then. Let you get on. Thanks for stopping by. She knew he did it because he cared, and it was nice to have people on your side. Hazel walked him to the door, and when they got there, he pulled her into a hug. I'll see you again soon. 
He kissed the tip of her nose as though they weren't taking a break from one another at all, and added, Think about what I've said, Hazel. I don't want this place to break you. All she could do was wave him off and then close the door behind him before leaning against the wood. This place had almost broken her, but she wanted to fight back. She wanted to push through to the other side, and his words didn't help, even though they came from a good place. Hazel rushed upstairs to clean her teeth, then back in the kitchen she pulled on her boots, only just remembering to take the sketch with her when she left the house. As Hazel hurried past to the office, drawing in hand, Arnold was unloading hay into the barn behind the stable block. She unlocked the office, found one of her notebooks from the shelf above the desk, and slotted the drawing in there. Arnold wouldn't find it there, nobody would. Her slightly naughty secret should be safe. She was still grinning after one last appreciative glance at the drawing before she checked the office voicemail for messages. There was one from a man who was interested in stabling his horse here. Hazel did a little clap. They'd been advertising vacancies at the Heritage View stables for a while, trying to fill the last remaining spot. With capacity for ten horses, they'd only had eight at the start of the year when one owner moved to Wales and another retired and was able to keep the horse on his own land. One spot had been filled last month, but the other had remained vacant. Livery was an important source of income for them, although they made most of their income from the riding school. Arnold would be happy too, especially as the owner had said he would stop by today so they could get things moving sooner rather than later. Hazel headed to the stable block to say good morning to the horses, her favourite thing to do. They stabled their horses overnight, and it was reassuring to know they were safely tucked away. It was a nicely renovated block, having had a makeover recently, and now, rather than ten separate stables facing each other and blocked in on either side, each stable was separated with bars positioned on the upper portion of the walls. Horses were highly sociable animals, and this way they could see one another. It also meant that the stables were well ventilated. The first task of the day would be to turn out the horses from the stables to the paddocks. Hazel opened up and folded back the main doors to the stable block. She fixed each door out of the way using the sturdy hooks to leave a nice wide entrance all the way down the middle. There were five stables on either side, as well as a dedicated wash area and a space opposite that to keep supplies including shampoos, brushes, buckets, wheelbarrows and a selection of shovels and pitchforks. There was a hay bale there right now, the surplus they hadn't needed for the nets last night, but rather than put it back in the barn, they'd left it here for the next top-up. After she put her basic grooming kit outside the stable block, she called out, Good morning, guys and gals, and started with Sherbet, the liveliest horse of the bunch, and the one who already had her nose poking over the stable door, anxious to get her day started properly. She wasn't daft. None of the horses were. They all knew this was coming the second those stable block doors opened in the mornings. Hazel ran a hand down the Palomino mare's golden nose and felt the horse's breath on her face as she opened up her stable door. You always have to be first, don't you? She fitted the horse with the halter and led Sherbet out into the morning sunshine, where she fixed the halter loosely to the wall with a rope, close enough so Sherbet couldn't go running off anywhere, but with room for movement should the horse want to turn her head. She picked out Sherbet's hooves and gave her a quick brush before leading her over to the paddock, the familiar clippity-clop sound a simple part of her life here at Heritage View. Hazel closed the gate to the paddock. Sherbet had already stretched her long neck towards the ground to nibble at the grass. Hazel repeated the turnout process with every horse until it was time to go back for the last. She greeted Jigsaw, a gelding who had done well to be so patient, his long face looking at her over his stable door as if to ask when it would be his turn. Last but not least, Jigsaw, she smiled before running a hand down from the area between his eyes to the tip of his nose, her cheek against his for a moment. You're a handsome boy. I appreciate the compliment, came a voice from behind her before she had a chance to open up Jigsaw's stable door. She turned and came face to face with someone who looked oddly familiar. 
She couldn't quite deduce who the man was as his body was outlined by the sunshine pouring in, making it hard to look directly at him. May I help you? He extended a hand as his body moved out of the sunlight. I'm Gus. I just spoke to your brother and he pointed me in your direction. I called and left a message about keeping my horse here. He hesitated. Do I have the wrong person? You're not Hazel? Hazel had lost the ability to speak. No wonder he seemed familiar. It wasn't that many hours ago that she'd been attempting to draw the outline of his body. Except he'd been sitting down and totally naked. Now he wore well-fitted jeans and a white T-shirt, neither of which detracted from the body she knew lay beneath, and she focused on Jigsaw to hide her face from him. It wasn't that she'd seen him naked that was the worst thing. It was that after the class, she'd seen him angry, threatening, and it had brought back terrible memories for her of a confrontation that had changed everything. Was this really the sort of man she wanted to have any involvement with, despite him bringing business their way? Are you Hazel? he repeated, as she grabbed Jigsaw's halter and undid his stable door. Jigsaw's ears twitched at the conversation as she slipped his halter over his head before leading him out of the stable. I'm Hazel, yes. The man, who she now knew as Gus, followed her down the centre of the stable block towards the outside. Is now a bad time? When she said nothing, he sighed. I should have called again, given you a time to expect me. It's just, I have things to do later on this morning and I really wanted to sort the stabling today if I can. You do have space, don't you? Hazel secured the rope to the halter and the halter to the wall, ensuring Jigsaw was comfortable. She had to put this man's behaviour last night out of her mind. This was business, income, their livelihood. It's good to meet you. Always a busy time here, but we can still talk. Feel free to wander around while I get Jigsaw groomed and out into the paddock. Thanks, I appreciate it. She'd already grabbed the hoof pick, and with a little coaxing of her hand running down Jigsaw's hind leg, the horse lifted his foot off the floor so she could get on. She wasn't sorry when Gus went over to look at the outdoor school before taking a peek into the stable block and then moved over towards the paddock while she worked. She wasn't sure she wanted to do this with him as an audience. He made her jittery, which had plenty to do with seeing him naked, but a lot to do with his temper too. Before long, she led Jigsaw over to the paddock so he could join the others. Gus's brow furrowed as she closed the gate. I'm sorry, have we met before? Unsure quite what to say, she led the way towards the office, indicating for him to follow. But before they got there, she turned to face him, and in that moment, she saw recognition dawn on his face. Chapter 3 Gus wished the guy with the hay who'd introduced himself as Arnold hadn't been busy because it would have been a whole lot easier talking to him rather than this woman who had already seen him naked. It was what his daughter Abigail might describe as hashtag awkward. When Gus was embarrassed, he usually got a compulsion to flee, something he'd really wanted to do last night in that church hall where he'd sat on a hard wooden chair in front of half a dozen people, pencils and sketch pads at the ready. He'd done his best to tell himself that these were people interested in art in a serious way. They weren't there to ogle him or ridicule him. He'd done his best to look confident and hoped the session would go quickly so he could put his clothes back on and go to meet his daughter, who was in one of the back rooms of the church hall waiting for him. The sooner the art class was over with, he'd told himself, the better. And as far as he was concerned... No matter how much he owed anyone a favour, he'd never volunteer for anything like this ever again. You were at the art class, he said to Hazel, as they reached what he assumed was the office. She stopped and scraped her boots on an ornate boot scraper that looked far too fancy for clumps of dirt and hay. He still couldn't believe his bad luck. He'd modelled once, as a huge favour, 
He'd gone to a class well away from where he used to live and far enough from here in Heritage Cove, the village where he was setting up home, assuming he'd never see any of the amateur artists ever again. Yes, I was. Hazel, now inside the office, held out a hand to indicate the free chair at the side of the desk as she sat in the larger leather one. He went to close the door, but she shook her head. It's a lovely day, leave it open. Gus's compulsion to flee a situation was almost as great now as it had been at the art class, as he sat at an angle to Hazel, who looked equally uncomfortable. He only hoped she didn't judge him on last night, and wouldn't see him as anything other than a respectable man, a father, and a horse owner. Because if they couldn't keep their horse here, he wasn't sure what he'd do, and Abigail would be devastated. Hazel leaned and pulled a folder from the filing cabinet. She didn't seem keen to talk about the art class either, which was more than fine by him. You were after a working livery, is that correct? She opened up the folder and took out a pamphlet, plus what looked like a form, pushing her chair back a little to create a bit more distance between them. That is correct. Weird being formal with someone who had seen your birthday suit already. Although, could you clarify exactly what working livery is? I've had an informal arrangement up until now, but my understanding is that working livery is cheaper than full livery in exchange for you using the horse during lessons. Your understanding is correct? Her voice wobbled. She seemed nervous, but gathered herself quite quickly as she explained. We will use your horse for lessons, which keeps their fitness and their schooling abilities up to date. The full list of inclusions we provide here for your horse is in the paperwork, but to give a brief overview, we keep your horse in a stable overnight, we deal with turnout and bringing him in for the night, we feed the horse and we'll take care of grooming needs as and when required. When he first arrives, we'll need to assess him to be totally sure he's suitable for working livery, but judging by what you said in your voicemail, I don't see a problem. What if he isn't suitable? Then it's a discussion and we take it from there. Denby was a good horse. He'd been ridden by plenty of different people. And Gus couldn't see a problem either. And while it would be expensive to pay for full livery if he couldn't be used for lessons, Gus would just have to suck it up and pay the extra cost. He just hoped it wouldn't come to that. Let me tell you a bit about us, she went on. Businesslike, she gave him the rundown of the place. The Heritage View Stables are a family business, owned and run by me and my brother Arnold, who you just met, and prior to that, our parents. They retired, she added, before he could jump to any conclusions. Probably wise, he already had a fear of somehow making a total idiot of himself again in front of this woman. Arnold and I have worked with horses ever since we were kids. We have a lot of experience, both riding and caring for horses and teaching. Before he had a chance to ask about the teaching, she added, What's your horse's name? Denby. A small smile spread across her face and she looked a lot prettier when she lost the frown. That's a nice name. And you've recently moved to the village? We have. And where do you currently keep Denby? He's stabled with a good friend and neighbour, the woman who sold him to us actually, back in the Peak District.